stuck in capitalism. Um, I do believe that many problems can be solved with free market capitalism. For semantic sake, I want to clarify that from here on out, when I, I want, uh, I'm going to refer to capitalism as individualism. That way there's no confusion because I know capitalism can be a loaded term with multiple, multiple connotations. One of the issues that I see often in the liberty community is the schism between individualist anarchists and collectivist anarchists. Each faction seems to be more interested in discrediting the other. Okay, um, I'm just confused as you are because on some things I'm an individualist and anarchist, and on some things I'm on super pro uh, open source or free software, the new term, like the correct term. Okay. And so, um, I, like my biggest argument within like libertarian circle is uh, on property, uh, intellectual property. And uh, like Ayn Rand versus Tucker, and I, I like I us I'm usually on Rand's uh, side, but I'm, for intellectual property, I'm on Tucker's side. So I just wanted to get your uh, just your thoughts on intellectual intellectual property. Okay, uh, intellectual property. Well, first of all, I'm not a minarchist. I'm not an objectivist. I'm an anarchist. Anarchist without adjectives. I don't subscribe to you know being called being labeled an anarcho communist or an anarcho capitalist. And anarcho-socialist just sounds like an oxymoron to me. And intellectual property, who enforces intellectual property? The state. Well, without the state, who would? Who, who, would, who would build the roads? Without the state, who would shoot the dogs? Without the state, who would enforce intellectual property? Nobody, really. Nobody, exactly. Intellectual property is what makes Monsanto as huge as it is. Intellectual property, uh, the end result of intellectual property is that, pe that some people who don't have the resources suffer with illnesses because the medicine that could save their lives or that could treat their illness is patented and can't be copied at a cheaper price. Often uh, when, uh, med when, when, uh, when medications and treatments and inventions are developed, there is a patent period during which no other company can create a copy or a facsimile of the product. So during that period, the product is as expensive as it can be. And the excuse is to you know, reimburse the inventor for the research and development of that product. But you, know, you can justify it all you want. The end result is that people who could be treated who could be cured of their diseases or their illnesses are not. And it's because of intellectual property. I don't support intellectual property. Hey, I'm with you on that. It's not Dr. Oh, God. Should, should <laughs> I even give you the mic? No. Oh, my God. You are. <coughs> Sorry. Are, are, are you going to troll this shit? No. Okay. <laughs> I am going to be a semantic asshole, though. Um, so, uh, but hey, at least I'm honest. Um, so I did want to raise one historical piece. Uh, Karl Marx did not coin the term capitalism. Um, uh, it was originally, at least as far as I know, um, it was for the for the term the, the term capitalism itself was first used by um, uh, Macri. Uh, he was an English guy. He had this uh, this novel. Uh, I wish I could look it up. I don't have access to the internet here, so I was gonna look it up. Um, but. Uh, but he had, he had this novel, he referred to uh, capitalism as an actual system. And even, even after that, uh, Thomas Hodgkin, who was basically the equivalent of a free market socialist, um, talked about capitalists. He never said the word capitalism, but I mean, you can basically extrapolate from what he was saying that we lived in a system where labor was denied its, its, uh, you know, its true product because the uh, monopoly on uh, production and all that. So I just wanted to be a semantic asshole. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so people who invent things, who have um, their gift or their talent or their labor, is it's intellectual. They should not be able to make 
a livelihood from that, or they should not be able to reap some benefit from what they've done? No, I'm not saying that. They absolutely should. Uh, they absolutely should uh, make a living. They should benefit from the fruits of their labor. If, like, say, if you're an inventor and you invent a new vaccine that can cure people, and uh, you know, can cure a particular uh, malady, and there is, let's say, there is no such thing as intellectual property. By virtue of being the inventor, you already have a head start on your competitors. While your competitors are do are doing research and development and like reverse engineering your your invention. You're out marketing it. You have a head start. You have a head start on your competitors. And not only that, by the time your competitors catch up, you may have already improved on the product. And again, you'll be you'll, you'll have a head start of your competitors. You'll have a head start that your competitors wish they could have, that they would love to have. But what about that argument about? covering the cost of research and development. Like in the pharmaceutical field, well, huh, I, I can't figure this out now. It's yeah. <laughs> how it usually happens. So I was going to say, the way something gets legitimacy is by doing a double-blind study. They cost millions and millions of dollars. So people or companies really do need a sufficient amount of time to cover that before they're even even. Right. Well, you have, to, you have to ask yourself, why, why is research and development so expensive in the first place? First of all, uh, med medicine, healthcare, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the United States. They have to follow certain rules for research, and, uh, and, and most of the leading companies the largest companies, they need FDA FDA approval, which costs a lot of money. How many? You know, that's a lot of politicians arrive. There are big pharma has more lobbyists in Congress than there are Congress members in Congress. That's why that's why research and development is as ex, is as expensive as it is because of the state, because of the regulations, because of the efforts. The hoops that these companies jump through just to bribe the politicians for the FDA approval. You know, you have uh, a lot of medicines that are FDA approved and then suddenly they're recalled, which means the check bounced. Oh. So, um, if, if I could respond a little bit to, not to, you know, take away, yeah. but, uh, but if you've heard of Mary Ruert, she wrote a fantastic book called Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression. And I'm happy to write that book title down for you. But she was in pharmaceutical R&D. That was her main field for years. And so her chapter on, uh, on why the medicine is so expensive and also uh, her chapter on intellectual property and how that would be solved in a voluntary society are excellent, excellent resources. Um, but yeah, like you said, the reason pharmaceuticals are so expensive and why R&D is so expensive is because of the state. And the other thing is, even when a company makes a generic um, brand, people still, I mean, people still pay extra for Advil and a leave, even though sitting right next to it on the shelf is the exact same product, just with a Walgreens label or whatever. So people are still drawn to the original, to the name brand, even when it's the exact same product. So uh, that was healing our world in an age of aggression. Mary Ruart is one of my idols. So yeah, Mary Ruart, R U W A R T. And the first edition of her book is available for free online. Thank you, Sabriel, and congratulations on your wedding this weekend. Show everybody your badass haircut. Bam. Oh. Ow! Yeah.
Here comes the trolling. Okay, so I'm not going to troll, but okay. I am going to. Um, I just want to really recommend this huge book, and this, this is a particular section I'm recommending, oh. but, but it's called Organization Theory. It's by Kevin Carson, who's like free market anti capitalist kind of guy. Um, but he has this, this section that I was thinking about that, thank you. Okay, well, I wasn't asking for that, but thank you. Um, so he talks a lot about the, 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 the R&D um, sort of uh, section of, of the, the drug industry, particularly. Um, so he said the drug industry's massive R&D spending is almost entirely directed towards gaming the patent system rather than genuine innovation. A majority of R&D spending goes to, uh, towards tweaking existing drugs on the verge of going generic, just enough to justify a patent for the Me Too version of the old cash cow, rather than to developing fundamentally new dr uh, drugs. Uh, even when fundamentally new drugs are developed, the majority of the total cost is not for developing the drug itself, but for testing all the possible variants of the drug in order to secure patent lockdowns. Um, I'm not going to read more, although I want to, but it's a really good book. I really recommend it. Uh, it's huge, though. But, um, but I just think, in general, I mean, just like patents are a total um, sort of monopoly privilege that historically have benefited uh, a very small class of people. Um, the, the creation of, of patents, and I know this is kind of going off the original topic, but it's a good topic to discuss anyway. Um, it was originally in England where they had, it was expressly not for the benefit of the artist, but it was for the benefit of the publishing houses that they would be able to secure the rights to these books and they'd be able to make all the profits themselves and that the artists wouldn't, wouldn't make quite as much and there would be less competition on uh, costs and stuff like that. So I'm going to stop talking the mic. Thank you. I just wanted to um, kind of question your your developing of individualism with uh, capitalism, because I know the whole individualist anarchist tradition of the 19th century was very anti-capitalist, like Benjamin Tucker. So I feel like he would disagree with that definition of individualism as capitalism. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, yeah, capitalism is a lot of term that has changed connotation over the years depending on what time period you are and depending on what person is using that word. So I, for the sake of, uh, and, and also individualism and capitalism are not synonymous, but they're not mutually exclusive either. And there is some overlap, So, but I wanted to frame this discussion of uh, individualism versus collectivism. Because people often associate, they have certain ideas in their head when they speak of collectivism. And uh, collectivism can in fact be just as voluntary as individualism. And as I've demonstrated, we embrace and engage both voluntary individualism and voluntary collectivism on a daily basis. Collectivism, in fact, is as natural as breathing. I mean, what are, what are we? What am I? Except a collective of body parts <laughs> working in collaboration. You know, and you go further in a, a micro, a microscopic uh, context, and millions of skin cells, millions of t uh, tissue cells, atoms and neutrons and protons and croutons. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. Yeah, pretty crunchy. Um, any other? Did you have? So, I'm not sure if you have So, I never really like, used the terms individualism or collectivism the way you seem to be using them. To me, uh, closer? Yeah. Okay, I, I don't like people hearing me. <laughs> um, I think of individualism and collectivism not as methodologies, but first and foremost as moral viewpoints, which are uh, a methodology is second to the view, secondary to the viewpoint. Um, so to say that uh, I'm still going to call myself an individualist is to say that the group is more efficient than the individual. Is not to say that the group is greater than the individual. Individualism says one plus one plus one plus one equals four. Collectivism says one plus one plus one plus one equals a billion, bajillion, or whatever. So, and, and I'm not going to 
to me, collectivism is mathematically incorrect, as well as, you know, a million other things. So, are you making a distinction between functional collectivism and moral collectivism? I guess is the question. Well, the... <laughs> I'm not going that deep, but uh, the distinction I was making was between voluntary collectivism and involuntary collectivism. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as there's no coercion or force, it's all good. Can I add something on that? Certainly. I guess um, I'll use an example of one of my uh, former friends who explained open source to me. Voluntary collectivism is like uh, well, when you were a kid, you were going to the beach and you were building uh, sand castles. Well, just think as a building box. One kid starts at the base, and then one more kid comes and does one more row, and one more row, and one more row. But you're all voluntarily building a castle. No one is forcing you to build a castle. That's what voluntary, I think that's what by like the open source community is. You're, it's like a, instead of having one company developing a software in one single location, it's a, like 200 developers all around the world working 24-7, answering bugs and like, uh, in non-stop uh, fixing bugs. So that's why I'm using the Firefox Mac build because I, I know that every time it crashes, it sends a little report and someone's going to work on that. So that's my way of working in the open source. Uh, to uh, comment on her point, it is important to note that uh, historically and currently a great deal of people who have advocated advocated uh, anti-authoritarian uh, collectivism on, in, on a strategic level and eco in economic methodology stuff have, have, have been, uh, there are, have been uh, strong ethical individualists um, uh, Examples that come to mind would be Emma Goldman, Eric Musam. Uh, so you can find you can find an Oscar Wilde too. Uh, you can find some examples of, of of that within the within the you know within the social anarchist school of thought. Um, though not all social anarchists are uh, philosophical individualists. Uh, many are philosophical collectivists. Many are in fact philosophical individualists. Thank you, and if uh, if I can reiterate. I'm not advocating that collectivism is the only approach we should use. Factor, and I don't know if that, you know, how that relates to individualism versus collectivism. I don't know if one is more individualist or collectivist than the other, uh, you know, landlord-tenant relationship versus a co-op um, building where everyone owns their own apartment. One's more occupancy and use and it's socialist and one's more capitalist, but they're both to be collectivists, right? They're both people cooperating, someone's fronting the money to buy the building and then signing a contract with someone else. How's that not just as collectivist as the the other one? Uh, so your thoughts on that versus related to capitalism versus socialism and some of those traditional definitions? Well, I mean, anything involving the state is a collective. And what you're referring to, if I'm not incorrect, uh, is crony capitalism, right? Well, no, not necessarily. You could just rent a, a any landlord relationship, you know. Uh, yeah. So whether, however, you got the building, uh, maybe you got it for crony purposes, but plenty of buildings have been acquired legitimately and then rented out. Okay. So, but I would still define any sort of absentee relation as capitalist. Uh, that, that's typically the language used in uh, the literature. So, well, I'm kind of uh, kind of mixed on absentee. Uh, ownership because the the state is the largest absentee owner in the world i mean if if there is unused land undeveloped land that is just not being used not being lived on while people are homeless in the streets it's usually because it's been seized because it hasn't you know the previous owner didn't pay their property taxes or well, you know it's not i don't like the the Tommy Pingos and the socialists like to say, oh, you know, at, you know, some guy has three summer homes, or John McCain has seven homes. Well, people are, are in the streets and homeless and, you know, living in tents in the forest and in homeless shelters. 
but the but the reality uh, majority the vast ma the overwhelming majority of uh, of properties that are un that are empty and unused are owned by the government. Almost all the land out west is owned by the government, like ninety percent of it. Exactly. Which is why New Hampshire rocks. No. <laughs> Move here. Anybody else? Okay, hey, uh, I just wanted to, I guess, uh, say that I, I think I could sort of. It, she she earlier said that uh, trying to make a distinction between uh, practical collectivism and uh, philosophical collectivism, and you said your distinction is between coercive and voluntary, but I think that's really the same thing because voluntary is an eye of the beholder. Because if you're an individualist, voluntary means I can join the collective or be on my own. If you're a collectivist philosophically, voluntary means uh, you know I can take whatever anyone else made or I well okay voluntary might mean you don't believe in absolute property rights. And then coercive means I assert uh, absolute property rights. So the definition the definition of voluntary is based on which philosophy you're using. That's, so you're kind of talking about the same thing. Well, in the examples I use, uh, such as open source software, who is being coerced into being a part oh. of that, into the development or the coding? No, no, one. no. no I, I don't. Th I think that there. Are, I think most. Oh, I think by and large, well. I, I wouldn't be surprised to you if most people who are fans of open source are also in, philosophically individualists. And I, and I don't know how you could coerce someone into participating in free software or anything, but yeah, no, I, I, I uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, but I mean, I was thinking more of like hard resources in cases of that, that might be more relevant distinction. But, yeah. yeah, what do you mean, what, what, what would be an example of hard resource, like a book? No, like if you're if you're writing if you're writing a firm or something like that, and somebody uh, somebody says, "Well, I'm in charge of the firm, and here's you know, I get the money, and then I pay you," and then the workers will say, "Well, no, we work here. Uh, we have just as much of a right to everything as anyone else." So, you know, maybe that's slightly out of the context of this conversation, but I don't. Know. Like you're uh, speaking in terms of a workers' cooperative. Yeah. Well, I mean, workers' cooperatives only exist upon the consensus of everybody involved. If there's a, a, a the entrepreneur and he started the, you know, he, the company was built as an individualist hierarchy, everybody, including that person, has to agree to become a, co a cooperative. So if people, if the workers at the bottom want to unionize or uh, or, or, or turn the, the firm into a cooperative, well, not everybody in the firm agrees. Yeah. They're free to leave and start their own co workers' cooperative. Yeah. They have no right to infringe, they have no right to shove their, uh, their ideas of what the firm should be yeah. on everybody in the firm. Yeah. Unless everybody in the firm agrees. I, I agree with According to my philosophy, I agree with you. However, to according to the philosophy of like philosophical collectivists, as I think she was implying, I think they would disagree with us. I think they would say, or, or you know, maybe, maybe there's a difference between a collectivist and an outright communist. They have the wrong idea, but they would think they would say, whether or not you like it, you have no right to be this entrepreneur. Every we're now a collective. You know, we don't like it, you leave. Kind of thing. Anyway. Well, co communism is a specific ideology, and uh, as Karl Marx puts it, communism is, com communism is the second phase of the of what he deems to be the necessary first phase. Anarchist collectivists don't see that first phase as legitimate. I mean, the idea that you're going—I mean, if you think libertarianism is crazy, the idea of uh, a of asking government to relinquish all the power that it's taken. Yeah. Socialism is really crazy. Yeah. Giving giving it just giving it more and more power than saying, okay, fuck off. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's not gonna happen. Right. So the you know, the more realistic solution would be just to just render the state obsolete.
Oh boy. <laughs> I'm not a problem. Don't treat me like a problem. So, um, uh, so, so two quick points. Uh, one, uh, I'm going to open up a little bit of a can of worms by saying I think that the, there's a false dichotomy uh, within the sort of fundamental reference points that we have here. They do think that there are certain synthesis of individualism and socialism, namely uh, the philosophy of uh, mutualism uh, uh, via figures such as Pyrrhus of Proudhon and Thierry de Lhomme and so on and so forth. Um, so I do think there's a little bit of false dichotomy, but even worse than that, I think that my second point would be sort of, sort of an egoist point that I think a lot of us, when we're talking about collectivists and we're talking about individuals, I don't think we're talking about anything other than spoofs. Like we don't have any reference points or people in mind. We're just talking about these abstract ideas that no one's defining and no one's, we don't have a picture of. So when people are trying to grasp at these, at these things and say these things, I'm just kind of scratching my head like, well, what the hell are we talking about? Like, no, nobody's pointing to anything. People are just saying these words and we're all supposed to just assume it means the same thing, you know? Uh, it's a general problem with everybody. I mean, I do it too, so I'm not like trying to start anything, but, you know, I just think for general purposes, it's, it's useful to have reference points or at least to say, these are certain positions that belie this sort of um, idea, and here are like examples of that. So I don't know. Just you know, stop the spooks. Okay. Well, um, one thing I I gave my reference point. Sure. Of uh, socialism versus communism. Sure. And that was the Karl, the Karl Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto. Um, again, this is my view. And I gave examples such as open source software, real world examples, not abstract ideas. I it's mean, a general know, comment, not specifically aimed at you, Daniel. I know. Okay. I, know. I won't take it personally, okay. individually. Um, You're targeting the collective. I'm targeting the collective. Um, but yeah, I gave references, and I'm going to pass the mic to Andrew. this. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think your property definition ethics depend on whether it's coerced or involuntary, as he was saying. And I agree with Nick that, you know, really these things, um, if we can't all agree on the terms, then just aren't debating over terms are meaningless. So it's, I think it's good to kind of get into more philosophically sound things like property definitions, like absentee property versus occupancy and use when we're talking about our concept versus things like individualism and collectivism which are so debated and everyone has a different concept of what it means and sometimes I think we're talking, we're using the same words but speaking different languages when we talk past each other. But so, so for instance, voluntary versus coercive, your property ethics could determine whether it's voluntary or coercive. Like if I have a farm and I rent it out for 10 years, then in an absentee property system I have the right to get my farm back in a you know occupancy and use system the person who has that farm now, you know, you could say, well, he's a sharecropper, and sharecroppers have the right to overthrow their tenants so he doesn't get to give it back. So, if, you know, it depends on your property ethics, even whether it's voluntary or coercive. So, say, I don't know, that's the end of rant, but, uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going uh, to clarify myself on absentee property rights. The fact is, the vast, vast majority, the largest, uh, vast majority of properties that are absent that have absentee owners the owner is the state the state is the largest absentee owner in the world well we all rent from the state right we don't even own our own property we pay property taxes true <laughs> so in the absence of, a, of the state yeah. the small number of individuals who own who are absentee owners the numbers are so small it wouldn't impact it, it wouldn't impact as many people as are impacted now. So let them have their absentee. You know, if they own it, they own it, and that's it. Let them have it. Because their, their absentee ownership is a, is a small, small sliver compared to the absentee owner, the big bopper of absentee ownership, the state.